Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome everyone. Still got a few people connecting. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to see so many of you today. I'm not seeing very many because most people are off their cameras, but it's great to see the turnout so far. So welcome. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Do keep your audio on mute, please. We do feel free to keep your video on if you'd like, um, but uh, keep your, uh, your audio muted. Um, also, please introduce yourself in the chat so that everyone knows who you are. You can also comment or ask questions in the chat anytime during the discussion. We'll be monitoring those and we will try to respond to as many questions as possible. So just keep them coming. So my name is Nadia Martinez and I lead the Secretariat of the Smallholder and Agri SME Finance and Investment Network. For those of you who don't know us, SAFIN is a network of organizations working across the um, Agri SME investment landscape. And we're working collectively to advance inclusive finance for Agri SMEs and to reduce this persistent finance gap by addressing bottlenecks at the ecosystem level. So before I kick us off, I'd like to thank our co-hosts at Market Links, my Safin uh, colleagues, and especially our panelists, Song Bei Li, Jovitas Ruta Kiniqua, and Wouter van der Seipen, who agreed to share their insights and experiences today. They will introduce themselves directly and their organization, so I won't do that now. But Karina, I do also would like to ask you to say a bit about market links. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Nadia. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Karina. I'm the point of contacts for market links. Um, we're a knowledge dissemination platform for USAID focused on market systems development. Um, we've been providing communications and backend support to Safen for this webinar, but we will be hosting some post event resources on our event landing page. So be sure to check out our uh, website after the webinar. Thanks. Thank you very much. So this conversation with practitioners uh, today is the first session actually of a three-part webinar series where we're trying to tackle various aspects of agri-SME finance and from different perspectives. So you'll see, we'll hear from donors, we'll hear from banks and investment funds. Today, we wanna to take a deep dive into what it takes to reach the millions of small businesses that operate at every level of the food system that are the engines of rural economies and that often are the key to smallholder livelihoods. So these enterprises we know cannot grow or even sometimes survive without some level of financing, which is really hard to reach for all small businesses. The challenge is even compounded further by the fact that these are in agriculture. So the panel today will talk about the impact of agri SMEs, we'll dig into the eco economics of financing them and we'll discuss what donors can do to um, support investors and other organizations that are trying to innovate in the space. So again, please type your comments and questions in the chat. Enjoy the conversation. And Songbei, over to you. Thank you very much, Nadia. Um, briefly, I'm Songbei Lee. I am the Ag Finance Team Lead at USAID, based in Washington, DC. I've been here for about three and a half years. And it's it's really great to be here. And so just going to jump right into it. We don't have a lot of time and a lot to talk about. So I just like to start out by having our two panelists introduce themselves briefly and, and their organizations. So Jovitis, why don't I start with you? Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Hi, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, this is Jovitus Rita Kinikwa, newly appointed the country manager, SME Pakistan Tanzania. I was I've been appointed from January to aid this uh, the SME Pakistan uh, in Tanzania. Otherwise, I have stayed with the SME Pakistan for ten years as a great risk manager. Uh, that's it. And can you just maybe uh, we're going to talk a lot more about the SME Impact Fund, but maybe you just give kind of your 30 second elevator speech of what it is okay. and what you do. 
Now, what they find, SM Impact Fund is a non bank financial institution uh, dealing with the uh, uh, financing the agribusiness. Uh, we finance the SMEs in the agribusiness sector, traders and the processors, those who add value into the small orders, farmers' products. Our right. ticket size as we, uh, is between 50,000 euros to 500,000 uh, euros. Okay, uh, thank you. Great. Uh, wow, Wouter, who, um, uh, let me pass it over to you. Thank you, Songbei, Song and thank you very much uh, for uh, this opportunity. So my name is Wouter. I'm the executive director of Campani, uh, the founder of uh, Campani. We are based in Brussels. We are a, 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 um, you know, an um, um, impact first uh, impact investment fund. And we essentially, we provide patient growth capital for CapEx heavy investments. We do so using mostly subordinated debt with relatively small tickets indeed, uh, between 100 and 500,000 euro. Our average ticket size is 350. Um, and so our, we, with our investment, we allow our clients to um, refinance these capex, meaning land, buildings, machinery, always long-term, always, of course, productive assets. Um, and so it allows for a vertical integration, expansion, or diversification. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Great, thank you. I just I just want to jump in to so many different parts, but I'll try to uh, maintain some discipline to keep us moving forward. So we're talking today um, about the S in SME, <clears throat> the small and small and medium sized enterprises. So what does that really mean? Just to set some, um, uh, what's the term? Just to give a definition so we're all on the same page because it can mean so many things. Often, I try to think of it just as transaction size. To me, if you ask, if, if I want to know one thing about a fund or a bank, the type of lending or investing they do, I think you could learn the most by looking at the transaction size. So one definition of transaction size for SMEs, agri-SME specifically in Africa, used by Aceli Africa, which is uh, a USAID partner, are loans between $15,000 and $1.75 million. So that just means often called the missing middle. These are SMEs that are need money that's too large for an MFI, but still not quite large enough for um, a standard commercial bank to lend it to them without, without help. So today, I think what you heard from these in brief introductions, we're talking about the space below $500,000. 500,000 dollars, 500,000 euros. And the interesting thing is when you this is not an intro webinar. This is we're trying to get a little deeper in the weeds and what you realize to understand how to target these segments or even if we should, you need to start segment segmenting the sector even further. Um so they did introduce themselves. I want to make some kind of um summarize what they said because I think it's easier to understand the type of organizations that are that way, because when we introduced them, or I mean, when we invited them to the panel, it was because they are similar in the sense that they're doing the sub 500,000 euro transaction sizes. But as you'll discover, besides that, almost in every other aspect, they are different. So we're going to try to see, and at the same time, they are both very unique. So Campani, geography, global, at, at Javidas, do you call it SIF, S-I-F? Well, how, how do people? Oh, you're on mute. You, you know what I call it SIF. SIF, okay, so SIF, one yeah. country, Tanzania. Yes. The product, company, equity-like. SIF, debt. Transaction size, and we'll talk more about this later, but I would say that the average exposure, and we'll talk about, um, is going to be higher over 500,000 the average exposure for sif under 500,000 the tenor up to 10 years for company typically only up to a year for sif use of proceeds company capex sif working capital so almost on every every um topic or every uh 
every point they are doing different things, but they are targeting the same sector. So really looking forward to diving in. So we have an hour to roughly going to break it down. We're going to spend about 10 minutes on the how, 10 minutes on the economics, 10 minutes on the impact, and then uh, make sure we leave some time for Q&A and then wrapping up. One thing I just can't help myself, though, Wouter. Oh, sorry, Wouter, is you said your impact first. And can you just briefly tell me what is the difference between impact first and I assume the opposite finance first? Well, um, I guess it's the, um, the overarching goal, the over, you know, what uh, what takes precedence. Um, for us, Sangbei, it's actually quite simple. The fund economics of the money are such that it's the niche that we occupy, the type of investments that we do cannot be done with uh, purely commercial logic. And so in order to justify our activity, the social impact needs to be part of the equation uh, for any, any investor. Purely from a risk return point of view, it's, it's a non-starter campaign. So a heavy focus on the impact is, uh, is inherent to our approach. You know, the small yeah. farmer is absolutely central to what we do. I think this is just an important point. And because I often will hear you know, about people making investments where there's, quote, no trade-off. But I do believe that there's going to, when things come push, come to push or shove, whatever the term is, one is going to take precedence. And what you're saying is what's a priority is going to be the impact over the financial return, which I agree with. And now I'm not saying it's wrong for other investments, like maybe in renewable energy. If you have, if that is your goal, you're likely going to get good returns, maybe even better returns with this, with a, with a social return. But in agriculture, what we what we find and what we'll be discussing about is that it's likely not possible, especially at the small ticket sizes. So it's just a point. Not saying one is correct or or not, but definitely in our case, we do see we have to make kind of a choice between. And there's that tension. A little bit more, also kind of like um, uh, ground setting, is talking about definitions. And this is sorry, I just it's a little pet peeve I have or about how do people use terms and mean different things. And one thing I've noticed in this agricultural sector is the shift of who we're targeting. I mean, on one hand, we used to work, USAID as an agency would work more directly with smallholder farmers. And then a lot of the work went to um, what we call now agri-SVs, but they, those used to be called just cooperatives. So I get confused. I don't know if others do as well. Are they different? Are they, what's, is there just a Venn diagram? So, and I know, so Wooter, in your mind, has the focus shifted away, first of all, from smallholder farmers? Because actually I was gonna, originally the first report I read by Dahlberg in 2012, over 10 years ago, was called Catalyzing Smallholder Agricultural Finance. Second, is it important to distinguish between agri-SMEs and co-ops? Because I, I think, Kampani will finance cooperatives, but I don't. I don't think SIF does. And second, what is your definition of an agri SME by transaction size? I know you guys have a target. Is that your definition, or is that just a subsegment of a broader definition? So, Wooter, let me let me ask you first. Uh, and there's a lot of questions wrapped into one there. Um, so the um, for me for for Kampani and our approach and how we work, there is a big difference between. Cooperatives, meaning you know businesses or legal entities that are farmer owned, uh, where the it's a, it's a, 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 you know the decision making is uh, one farmer one vote, uh, the leadership is elected by and comes from the membership itself. Um, these you know, this is this is uh, the nature of of a cooperative, and SME is in nature completely different. It's usually just a few shareholders, the founders, uh, it's they that uh, call the shots, uh, they run the show. And so in the, the relationship that we have with these clients, it's about half, half at the moment, half our portfolio, total of 20 deals. So about 10 are with cooperatives and the other 10 are with SMEs. And I find that the, the, the nature of our work, the nature of our relationship is really quite different so for me this this distinction is, is helpful and uh, I find that uh, 
quite a lot of funds make the decision not to invest in cooperatives. Uh, they do have a number of characteristics that adds to the risk profile. And yeah, we believe we're equipped to deal with that, but uh, I respect the decision of other funds to, to stay away from them. I, I So this is, I think you're, you, you said the points I was hoping you would, that there is a big difference. And I thought it's just been very interesting how they've been grouped together. I think partly because agri SMEs became the new flavor of the month for donors. It just sounded better. And they just included cooperatives. But I do agree, cooperatives as a segment have very different issues than agri SME as a business. So is it for SIF, do you choose not to finance cooperatives specifically for any of the reasons that Wilder mentioned? Yeah, thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, in East Africa, particularly Tanzania, there are no, there used to be cooperatives. There is no currency, there is no layer. Uh, there is really a uh, few cooperatives. So, very rare. So, we approach the uh, individual companies that, that is, uh, may be registered or sole proprietors. Those are the ones we are financing. We are not financing that uh, directly to the primary producers that are small older. Uh, Farmers, but we finance the intermediate, those who buy the crops of the uh, of the small order farmers. So by so doing, we uh, assure the uh, the small order farmers with the market of their products, but also the prices that the since the buyers have money, they don't borrow, they don't buy on credit, or oh, and also they can uh, we 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 encourage. Uh, what we call um, contract farming, that we are, we are the uh, SME financed by SIF can pre-finance uh, the small order farmer to do the production, and they have a for formal or informal contract where after the harvest we really supply to the SME. Thanks, Jovita. So yeah, it's a good point that I, I cooperatives I always I've known have always have a have had a stronger presence in Latin America. But I didn't, and I knew there were fewer in Africa. But it's I did not realize that they have been disappearing. Can you, do you know what what what's been happening to the cooperatives in East Africa? Is it governance issues? Of course, it is because they were. Uh, uh, remember, uh, in those days uh, when the socialism it was the government leading those uh, 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 intervening into the businesses, uh, making decisions. Uh, collecting the the cooperatives are almost under the government, Got and it. Okay. now we are encouraging private investment. Therefore, cooperatives uh, naturally disappear. Uh, interesting, and what and I think this is it's a common statement that folks say now that yes, we are even though we're working with SMEs, we're still reaching the smallholder farmers for the reasons you said. Do you have a minimum? How do you measure that? Is it is it just a description, or do they have to have do they have to sell product to a minimum number of farmers inputs do they have to buy you know uh you um the the crops from a certain minimum number of farmers or is it just the fact that they that's part of their business model no we encourage them to have a, a and even at the baseline we finish those who are, who are sourcing from the farmers at least 25 small order 25 farms. yeah sourcing okay and do you make a distinction and do you make a distinction between if they're sourcing, it has to be from 25, or if they're selling, it, does it have to be a much higher number? Because that's a different type of relationship. If they're selling seeds, they must. do you have a much higher requirement, or is it really the main requirement is that they source from farmers? Yeah, the main requirement is that they source from farmers. But the minimum, at least, the, that we can consider is uh, at least they are sourcing from not less than 25. Uh, small okay, different. wonderful. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So oh, this is um, we had a little discussion about this, but I do like you to touch on it. And this is um, in your there's a great article that there's um on that Wouter wrote in SSIR, the Stanford Social Innovation Review, and has a great description of their model. And and when they talk about the product, it says equity and equity like. So when I read it like that, it makes me think you do a lot of equity. But I think after we discuss, it, that's not true. So can you explain like why isn't it the case, but but and then still why is it important that it's equity like? Sure, thank you. Um, in indeed, I mean, Campania was created uh, some eight years ago now, 
And uh, at the outset, we thought we really needed uh, to do quite a lot of equity deals. We expected to do, we had set down to do two out of three deals uh, in with pure equity um, because we felt that we needed uh, the promise of the upside uh, in order to make the fund viable. Uh, but quite early on, we realized that the type of businesses that we are uh, interested in and that uh, absorb or have a need for these kind of ticket sizes that we're talking about. Mind you, these are businesses that um, have a turnover of half a million, a million uh, dollars annually. So these are small businesses indeed. Um, and so, you know, with that comes also, um, if you will, uh, yeah, for lack of a better word, level of sophistication, it, you know, making or attracting outside capital is not simply not their core business. And so doing an equity deal, a shareholder agreement with drag along rights, tag along rights, uh, bad lever clauses, all of those things, it gets incredibly complex very quickly. And so a lot of our clients simply are not equipped to, to negotiate usefully a, a deal like that. So that was the main reason or, or an important reason why we moved away from pure equity and why now out of our two deals, 18 are actually subordinated debt, so quasi-equity. It has other advantages, but um, just to keep it short, um, for us, these two instruments in terms of the ultimate objective that we're after, they are indeed interchangeable. Because ultimately what we want to do is strengthen the balance sheet. This is the core problem of a lot of these small businesses. Uh, they are unable to set aside uh, profits and the profits are upstreamed to the members. The members are poor, they have cash needs. And so, um, you know, especially with cooperatives where, like I said a minute ago, you know, the governance is, is, a, is a democracy. The General Assembly decides, the farmers themselves decide what to do with the profits. And so, in, in essence, they are upstream to the farmers. And so that leaves forever a cooperative with a very weak balance sheet. And that is what we were, what we are designed to address is to unlock that. Because with a stronger balance sheet, you can create a leverage on that. You can again borrow or borrow at better terms with local banks, with social lenders. Uh, you can invest long term. Um, so that is uh, what we, why we exclusively do quasi equity or equity. In our case, it's almost all subordinated debt indeed. And that's interesting. And just to build on the example, you said that, you know, pay, take, let's just take a cooperative, for example, that, you know, one benefit is they pay, quote, like dividends to their members. But if, if a farmer has a choice or they, they might, they need that cash for their living expenses, but the other alternative would be investing in it back in the business. But if they need that money to pay for their school, kids school, they don't have that opportunity. So this is why you're, the type of finance you provide for growth is so important. On the other hand, Jovitas, the type of youth financing that SIF provides is much different. Instead of long-term equity-like, yours is short-term debt-like. Can you explain how that works for SIF in your context? And, and have you ever considered doing longer term, more equity-like um, instruments? No, we're actually doing uh, short-term loans because uh, we are typically in the traditional food crops. And these are seasonal. Um, uh, so we are doing like a revolving fund that every year uh, we provide a loan to, uh, to the SMEs, they buy crops from the farmers and then they trade, they get, uh, so uh, out of their cash flow, they pay our loans, then they can uh, add up next, uh, next season, take a new loan. That's how they manage their cash. Otherwise, we can, uh, yeah. And I think the interesting thing is, so these are seasonal crops. So you're yes. doing more production, which is exactly. very high risk and most people avoid, but also are you doing cash crops? Or local value chains? No, it's not. Uh, later, eh, we are just we have had less than two percent. We are, we have done this uh, in coffee. At least only one of our chain that's coffee. We did it twice, but uh, no, no other. Cash so crops. it's me. So the the crop is mainly which crop? Uh, like uh, it's food crops like uh, mostly uh maize, uh, rice sunflower. and maize. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. and because I think the existing working capital finance out there is short-term working capital like you described, but primarily 
for cash crops like coffee and cocoa. So you, the niche you're providing, it's the same product, but for different value chains. And also, I think we'll, we'll be talking about later the different the geographies that you target. And Wilder, so then your borrowers, are they accessing that type of seasonal working capital from other sources? Yes. Okay. Uh, not so much because they are, um, uh, uh, the type of the uh, SMEs we are financing, uh, they are very big for the microfinance because the microfinance are providing very little, uh, I mean, uh, very low uh, or small uh, scale uh, funds. While the banks uh, will give bigger money but to the well-established uh, companies because they need uh, bigger collateral, they need uh, other form, form more, they need to be uh, on the next level uh, of formality. Got it. So, yeah. So, and so Wilder, I think you were saying or about to say that your borrowers might have existing relationships with traditional social lenders providing that short-term working capital? That's correct. Yeah, especially those that are, are uh, going for cash crops, they will they tend to have indeed an existing relationship with uh, a CISA member, with a social lender, uh, or with a uh, with a local bank for their uh, operating costs there or their trade okay. finance. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Correct. So I mean, so CSAF, um, Council for Smallholder Agricultural Finance, a network of social lenders. Great website to check out. They have a lot of great data and um, examples of lenders doing the type of work we're some of the work we're talking about now. I want to stay with you, Wouter. And um, when we talk donors, we talk about interventions in ag finance. We a simple way to look at it is we talk about increasing the supply of capital, and that's a lot of it's de-risking lenders with things like guarantees. We talk about the demand, increasing the demand for that capital by using technical assistance to build the capacity of those SMEs to um, to borrow or to uh, um, attract an investment. You talk about something in your in your SSIR, SSIR article called appropriateness, appro appropriateness of the financial instrument, which is talking about that sp that space in between. So it's not even increasing either side, but sounds like matching it better. What, what do you mean by appropriateness? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, indeed, I mean, if you're, if I approach this element mostly from the supply side. So supplying, financing to the sector, it's indeed about accessibility, it's about affordability, and then indeed appropriateness. And appropriateness, I mean that, uh, you know, a, a dollar that is lent for a year uh, and that is senior, uh, senior debt does not allow you to use it the same way as a dollar that is uh, lent to you for seven, eight years, and that is junior. Uh, so the type of investment you are able to do with these different types of money um, and the types of investments are, are, are different. Um, and so it's the strings attached that uh, make certain types of um, sources of money uh, more appropriate than others for any given type of investment. Um, one is not better than the other, um, but not all um, not all types of money are appropriate for all types of needs. There are just different types of financing needs, and you need to tailor it to the need. And one thing that's been interesting for me, Wilder, is that I've only recently learned about Campani's existence, but I've been hearing about it a lot in that short time. And I, I, I realized, is it is part of the reason because you are giving long-term loans or subordinated loans, convertible loans, equity-like products over such a long tenor, it's it's taken 10 years for you to see if the model works or not? Is this is that is that a right way to think of it? <laughs> Yeah, in part, it's absolutely true. I mean, the everything we do is is just it's, it's it, it takes a while. Eh? We've we've only exited from our very first investment uh, just last year. Yeah? So, if you want uh, to see the results of you know what we do, uh, some of it you, know, you need to be patient. Inherently, also in what we do, um, if you, you know, mo almost all of our investments, uh, in you know, include a, a construction phase. So sometimes it takes a year or longer to build what it is we finance. And then if you work in a in a crop that is an annual crop, then up, it's an, again another year before you see even the first impact. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's uh, that that could well explain uh, why we have not been. Why we're not. So and when you say exit, just to be clear, you're not 
Are you talking about selling an equity investment or a self-liquidating yeah. loan? No, sorry. And to be clear, it's in, in the turn, the last repayment where we're fully Okay, out. the last repayment. Okay, great. Which is which is still great when you're talking about a long-term subordinated loan. Exits, repay, full repayments are definitely what, what, what you're looking for. And I'm uh, sorry, will that be likely the, the, the loan that repaid the first one? Will you likely extend a new loan to that same borrower or do you try to not have repeat borrowers? No, we like we like to do add-ons or indeed uh, have repeat borrowers. Uh, we've done okay. four add-ons so far. If actually, in fact, the one that we just exited, again, the wrong terminology perhaps, but so is actually one where we did an add-on. Um, <clears throat> we are not able to continue working with them, unfortunately, and it's a cooperative, a coffee cooperative in Burundi. And so the monetary policy today of the national bank does makes it impossible to repatriate your your hard currency. So we are okay. unable, to, unable to work in the union. I want to talk a little about both of you about how you raise your capital. And Jovitas, you know, congratulations. Recently, you received a commitment from the Mastercard Foundation Africa Growth Fund, and I was just kind of curious, like how there's so many funds competing for that for that capital. Why do you think they chose SIF? Like, what was specific about your model? that attracted them, uh, attracted them to you or you to them and any details about that investment that you can share as far as whether it's first loss or whether it's Perry Pasu, the tenor, the rate that they're looking for, et cetera. Thanks, Sanbeid. Uh, the, the reason why uh, the factors that led the MasterCard to be attracted to invest in our fund is that the uh, interested in the real economic growth of uh, uh, rural uh, uh, businesses. And uh, what businesses? Uh, rural, 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 business. rural businesses, got it, yeah. So we are typically doing uh, doing that. And um, there are factors that they have identified uh, in their criteria that uh, this includes uh, uh, financing, uh, I mean, it's gender inclusion, youth inclusivity, uh, food security, um, and um, uh, changing the total, uh, the total change of, uh, of uh, uh, rural economics. You know, and a lot of these foundations, you know, donor supported activities. I think there's kind of a double-edged sword if they're providing necessary capital, but they have all these restrictions, which makes it challenging. I, how do you, I don't know if you feel comfortable talking about that. Do you think it's something that donors should keep doing and then you benefit from it or they should make it more unrestricted and just say, you know, you define the kind of development impact you're having. And if we think you're doing a good job, then we'll support you with our, with our capital. Yeah, it depends uh, uh, on the on the interests of the donors. If they are here, impact first, obvious, they will be uh, passionate and uh, support the uh, supporters. Because uh, once we, we develop these uh, rural uh, businesses, uh, small scale, they grow into uh, to the high level. They as, uh, they improve the standard of living of the small older farmers. Uh, uh, and uh, as you know, uh, in East Africa or Tanzania particularly, that uh, the almost 80 to 90 percent are in the uh, small scale farmers. And that's if you are willing to, if your ambition is to grow the uh, 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 to grow the, the rural economies, obvious that is the best fit investment. Thank you. So similar question, Wouter. You received a $1 million. Well, so I'll, first of all, I'll make clear that for SIF, it was an investment from the MasterCard Africa Growth Fund, and they wanted development impacts. For Wouter, for Campani, you got a grant from the Belgian government to be used as first loss specifically. So what was the what does first loss mean, and what's the, what's the, the goal that the Belgian government had by giving you that money? Yeah, thank you. Um, we are the only fund, uh, Belgian-based fund, to have received uh, such a grant, and they chose us because of the, the niche that we occupy. And the Belgian federal government has understood that what we do is uh, exceedingly rare, 
and very valuable and it needs to be scaled. Um, and their thinking was that with, uh, you know, when we talked earlier about the challenges of the niche or, or the, the, cho the choice of the investment strategy that we made determines the risk return ratio that we can offer our shareholders. And how can you improve that? It's by systematically de-risking the proposition. And so by, um, by inserting this first loss grant uh, or this first loss tranche, uh, we make it so that investors in Campani, uh, you know, for, for every 100 euro you put in, Campani would need to be underwater for more than five before the investor loses his or her uh, first euro. So it, it protects the downside risk uh, for the investor and has been incredibly successful huh? when, when that uh, grant was awarded. We were a tiny fund of just four million. And so that's two years ago, and now we're, we're at 15 million. Uh, so in terms of convincing additional private capital to join Campani, this has made a, a massive change. Okay. Yeah, so that's interesting. So I think, you know, for SIF, the money came in because they had development impacts that they wanted from the money actually being deployed. But for Campani, the money came in because they picked you because of the development impact you had, but they <laughs> they wanted you to use their money to attract additional capital by making a better better risk return profile for those other investors to come into the fund. Exactly. So this is this is to me it's like um this this is I'm reading so um Sith uh it was great reading reports about you you guys are both sharing a lot of information which it makes it easy to learn and this is something I was looking forward to asking you Jovitas about Sith. So in your you have you, you did a report about whether to expand into other countries, Uganda and Kenya. And in that report, you did a segmentation, which I, I also always love, and you of SMEs, and there's four different types. And you, cho you chose one, you chose something called, you, most of your borrowers are what are called livelihood sustaining enterprises. And these are described as informal family run businesses on the path to incremental growth. So what you did not choose to focus on is another group called high growth ventures, disruptive business model targeting large addressable markets with high growth and scale potential. So I was just curious, why would a fund choose to work on, would focus on businesses with incremental growth versus those businesses with scale potential? Okay, thank you. Uh, our interest is not to finance the sustainability of the, I uh, mean, the, the self-sustaining businesses. That's just the character of the of the market niche that you are target, targeting. But it, we didn't uh, decide to finance them just because of their uh, reliability. I mean, I mean, sustainability. We our interest is to finance the uh, the missing middle. These uh, uh, the, to finance the missing middle. These uh, middle inter entrepreneurs uh, who cannot be who the microfinance financing is low and the financial and uh, um, uh, return I mean financial lenders are, are too high for them. Uh, only to find now that uh, the group we are financing is falling under such a category of. Uh, so that makes sense. So that at least the you know the point that um, I want to also bring up where you're located. Not only are you in only Tanzania, but tell us where in Tanzania you are. I mean, most a lot of funds will talk about Campani based in based in Brussels, and you are based in Tanzania, but you're not even in the capital. Yeah, sure. Where, where's your Where's your office, and why are you located there? Our office is in a, uh, just a, in the northern uh, zone of Tanzania, that's in Arusha. But we are serving the whole country, uh, uh, the whole region, most uh, regions of the of the country. We are traveling from uh, one place to another, from a uh, region to the region. But uh, remember, the type of the entrepreneurs we are serving are in rural areas, so we travel. Are, they're, they're what? They are in rural, 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 rural okay, areas. right? Yeah, the rural areas, right? Um, and uh, of course, uh, since uh, uh, agriculture, uh, agriculture is done on a basis of nature, there is no big uh, uh, scale farming. They are, they are depending on rains and arable runs. These are also divided into regions. They are not in capital. 
So even the investment, the I mean the entrepreneurs, uh, middle entrepreneurs invest in nearby the sources of raw materials, which is up country and not in the capital. And so do when you say that the character of the market you're targeting, that's where the livelihood sustaining enterprises are located. Are there high growth ventures in Tanzania or are they in the capital or really maybe that's a market that that's um, very shallow in the whole country? Pardon? High, so high growth ventures are those mm -hmm. type of businesses. I, I think we're saying they don't exist in rural areas. Do they exist in the capital? Yeah, sure, they do. And why wouldn't SIF decide to target, move to the capital and target those businesses? And I'm asking this from the perspective of a donor. Let's say there is a fund targeting high growth ventures in the capital, and then there's SIF targeting livelihood sustaining enterprises in the in rural areas. Which one should I care more about? Or if I if I had to choose one, which one would I pick? Yeah, your choice will depend on your interest. If it is a, a financial returns, obvious you won't choose us. <laughs> no, <laughs> great answer. Exactly right. Yeah, you know, but those, if you those, are... those you know, potential companies, um, right? You, you people are going to be charging more for them, and they're going to be looking. There, those are probably equity investments, and they're probably sophisticated enough <laughs> that they can you can negotiate those and provide you a, with a higher return. Okay, great. Um, mm -hmm. So on that point. Um, Wooter, you decided to go global, and I've known your size is not it's not it's not small, but it's not large. And I I've known I've seen other funds really have challenges being spread so thin. Um, and there's so there's there's this benefit and this cost. Why did you guys choose to be global, and 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 are you going to stay in that direction after the experience you've had? Yeah, no, that's a, a valid question, of course. Um, you know, we're in the three continents, but ultimately it's uh, we're currently in 14 countries and we're likely to stick to no more than 20 countries. So in terms of number of countries, number of geographies, political situations, et cetera, et cetera we believe it is manageable. But the the, um, the true, true answer, Songbei, is that when we created Campani, we, uh, we wanted to be very opportunistic. We weren't even sure that uh, the types of deals that we are after even existed. Huh? Like the, it was real pioneering work, what, uh, what we did at, uh, at the outset. There were a lot of questions around, um, you know, in terms of our deal origination, for instance, maybe a quick aside on this. You know, we source our deals by our own shareholders and partners. And so it was a big, it was a real question at the beginning. Are our shareholders, so typical, typical TA providing NGOs, are they going to be equipped to filter and sources uh, the deals that you know that are bankable that uh, meet our criteria, etc.? So we had to really, um, you know, our, our niche is very narrow in many ways, but in terms of geography, we we felt that we needed to keep our options open. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I'm going to speed it up a little bit because I'm I want to just get to a couple more questions. One I did, did say I'd promised to ask from the LinkedIn post was from the M Nayembe Chape Shamo, very, I think a short answer. Will either of you be working in Zambia? We would like to be, um, okay. but so we, we want to build a, a pipe there and, and, and develop a network there with, with uh, partners that, that can be a risk our investment uh, and that help us with our determination. Yeah. So we are interested, but we're, we're, we need okay. to build a network. And Jovitas, are, are you any plans to expand to Zambia currently? Uh, no, not, not, no. Okay, I think. And then uh, the the two last questions I'm going to ask before looking at the um, the questions coming into the chat, just to let you know in advance. One about rates, and this is you know a lot of interest here, and the second about just measuring impact. So the first one is both of you. Can you talk about the rates you charge? Because for for Wilder, you there's I read somewhere that you look for a ten percent return on investees. I'm not sure what that means. Mm -hmm. If that's Maybe you could tell us, like, what is no. the return you look for from your borrowers, and how much do you look to pay your investors? And right. similarly, uh, for SIF, in your report that I read, the expansion uh, study, it says that you offer a, a rate of eighteen to twenty percent, but the breakdown later in the report shows that the cost is thirty-one percent. So I, I didn't know how how to. Um, reconcile that disconnect. So basically, why don't you just explain how much you charge 
and how much you pay your investors. Maybe we'll start there. Uh, so for Campani, our you know since most of our portfolio is in in subordinated debt, so with with an interest rate, it's easy to answer that question. Our interest uh, per, uh, per annum uh, is from eight to twelve percent. That's the range. Is that um, dollars or local this currency? This is hard currency. Um, yeah. And are your borrowers typically earning hard currency? Uh, well, <laughs> it, it would, we we would get into quite a lot of detail. So. If they don't, we we uh, we charge more, um, and so uh, okay. if they do, it depends on the currency or the monetary policy. Is it a crawling peg? Is it a fixed peg? It's okay. That and do you do any hedging on your side no. or no? No, we don't hedge. Okay, no hedging. And we will always put uh, currency risk with Campani. That that would be unfair, I think, uh, to put this with with the client. Uh, in terms of the return net for investor, we target uh, inflation plus. Uh, and so far, uh, we're on target to to do that. Yeah, it's inflation. Not... I guess Europe inflation, not not U.S. inflation. <laughs> yeah, the average and... of the past ten years. So we don't have. Oh, know... ten years, and yeah. you say inflation plus. What's the plus? The plus is the aspiration to do a little bit more than than. Oh, inflation. okay. It's okay. Never gonna be uh, an IRR of of seven eight percent. That's yes, I understand. Between... I've heard like I've heard black break even. So break even, but break yeah. even to the black versus the red. Okay. Yeah, that's the plan. But now you, I mean, it's a fragile business plan. What we have, eh? I want to be quite transparent about this. Um, you know, if we indeed uh, charge 11, 12 percent. And knowing that our fund management cost is going is is around seven point eight percent, that doesn't leave a lot of margin to pay for failures. Uh, okay. So we we are we are running a tank. Yeah. um Martin Susan specifically asked, how do you bring down that ten percent cost of funds that goes into the thirty one percent cost that goes to SME? But the other question as well is thirty one percent what your borrowers typically pay, or is it eighteen to twenty percent? Okay, the, uh, we have increased the, the interest, uh, the interest rate, uh, not like uh, the, uh, the, as we started after realizing that the costs are so high and we are not able to break even. But however, we are struggling to that by trying to upscale now. We are trying to bring in bigger goals. And of course, we try to do to benefit a bit to end through uh, economies of scale by producing uh, more loans. Yeah, that's how we're trying, but in the meantime, we are not breaking even or making profit. But okay, are... so when you're saying you raise the interest rate so so SIF can break even, is that what you meant? We believe so, but it's a combination of factors, not only by increasing interest, but also by trying to provide uh, uh, to avoid it because the cost, the most cost drivers are the uh, current uh, losses. We have the uh, uh, origination costs, yeah, yeah. and um, so we are trying to do. And the origination cost is high because we are, uh, we know we are dealing with the most informal uh, market niche. So we are trying to uh, to to apply and uh, give some uh, BDS uh, business development support and uh, technical assistance so that at least our entrepreneurs can manage well their cash flows and therefore. Uh, by so doing, they can repay well the loans, and therefore we avoid the light. Uh, I mean, the provision uh, uh, costs and recovery costs, but also uh, the the ordination becomes uh, cost is reduced by if there are our entrepreneurs are uh, well prepared and uh, borrowing ready. Okay, thank you, Jovitas. I'm going to ask you now. I want to just ask a few questions for folks in the chat. You can decide which, if any of them, either of you want to answer, just so we can go through. You can get an idea of what people are asking. This is very specific. For small ticket sizes, is it better? To find... Okay, I don't really, I didn't really understand that. Let me go down. Okay, this one says, Wooter, can you further explain why doing quasi equity over long term for an average exposure still cannot make commercial returns? Um, sec, another question. Let me just ask a couple more, and then um, I'll uh, then I'll pass it back. Do either of your approaches work in fragile contexts? For example, Myanmar. And lastly, is um, 
question technical assistance. What part of your model, what, what kind of role does technical assistance play in your model? And these questions were asked from Weem Abdel Jawood, uh, Tet Hut Ang, and, and Matt Ganazi. Gen Ganazini. So the first question is specifically to you, Wooder, and then the other two, um, I open it up. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So commercial returns for our investor is a complete non-starter given the choices we've made where really we start from the social impact, the social ill that we want to address and reverse engineer the solution for it. And that solution has to imply that investors are okay with breaking even, uh, you know, you know, uh, doing inflation plus. And the, the simple reason for that is that the transaction costs, the origin deal origination costs, all of those costs are simply too high relative to the ticket size to then on top of that promise a return on IRR of 15, 16%, it's, it's a non-starter. Um, fragile context, yes, very much. Uh, we, in fact, if you break it down, um, the, our portfolio, about a third, will be in, in, uh, in Lycus countries, in low-income countries under stress. Uh, we are in Congo, we are uh, in Myanmar, indeed. Uh, we are in a number of geographies, we're in Burkina Faso. That, uh, that 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 uh, you know show a high country risk. Um, TA very quickly. So we don't we have a little bit of TA, not very much, but this is in the direct sense of the word, meaning money that we manage and deploy ourselves. The strength of our model is much more on the indirect side. It's that multi-stakeholder model that we talk about at length in the SSIR article. It didn't come up today too much, but so we are never going to invest alone. Our relationship with the client extends always to our partners, partners like NGOs, social lenders, uh, sometimes a foundation. So there's always other organizations involved and through the core business that they do provide support or, you know, so that we approach our clients from a, a variety of angles. And we do that in, in a coordinated fashion and it's, it's been a you know, successful there's been a, a crucial factor in our success uh, in our success rate. Uh, we have had, uh, you know, we're we're at 20 deals and we've seen no no failures. No uh, no none of our companies have gone bankrupt. We've had to restructure a couple of loans, uh, but we have not had to write off anything, and that is really uh, much better than, than than what one could expect, given our niche. So, quick couple of answers uh, to these questions. Anything to add, Jovitas, maybe on the fragile context or technical assistance? Maybe on the technical assistance? Sorry, pardon? Uh, what, what is, does tech, do you provide technical assistance as far as, as part of your model? Yeah, of course, well, well, what we assist the clients is uh, like uh, um, basic uh, bookkeeping, record, uh, by keeping the records so that that helps us in uh, translating and um, uh, 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 interpreting their 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 financials, but also formalize some uh, little formalization like uh, open companies and uh, compliance. Yeah, those are the. So few. that bookkeeping is that something that you provide as a service? Do, do you a consultant comes in, or you pay them money to buy a, a bookkeeping up uh, to pay an accountant? How how does that work? Previously, we had a fund, and then uh, the, we started uh, offering it free at our cost. We had a fund which was we uh, are supporting, but then it died up. Then we started uh, a cost sharing that the clients could uh, contribute at from the beginning, and they uh, they enjoyed that. Uh, currently, we, we are not so much though. We are now sourcing the fund to start it. Uh, okay. Great, and Wouter, I'm glad you got to talk about your stakeholder model. We did not have a chance to address it earlier, but definitely recommend people to read the SSI article to learn more about it. Um, and also the person who asked the question about technical assistance, I know I know him and he works at an organized, um, he works at an activity called SNOOP, which provides technical assistance, multi-donor, multi-fund, SSNUP. Definitely check it out if you're not already aware of it. I'm going to ask um, a last question before I pat, and then and then I'll let you both give any closing remarks. So both of you, you know, I think uh, portfolio call it. I think you've de ten to fourteen million euro for Wilder. 
for uh for Jovitas dispersed fifteen million dollars since uh inception in 2013. So you've had it sounds like great impact, but at limited scale compared to other types of investment funds that might be more commercial. So my question is, is this a niche activity? Is it something that can scale? How interested should donors be in supporting these type of activities? Answer that question. And then anything else you'd like to say in your closing remarks? Um, shall I go first? Sure. Yeah. So um, obviously, well, is it a niche? Yes, it's very much a niche. Huh? And one of the struggles that I have is that a lot of funders or donors uh, look at an investment fund and, you know, it's investing in, in AC in, in Africa and, you know, they don't necessarily go much deeper um, and, and, and they are really, you know, what Capani is a niche fund in that what you need in terms of skill set, the nature of the dialogue that you have with clients like ours, you know, they, often are, are these farmer leaders have very little formal education you know, metaphorically, they don't speak our language. Huh? So it's it's really this this ability to communicate with our with our clients in a way that you know you can really have a useful conversation. This is not something that the type of activity that we do. You know, if you look at a DFI, a DFI in terms of procedures, in terms of um, skill set available in, in in with the staff, etc., they are not really equipped to do what we do. This is what I've I've come to really. Uh, be convinced of so yes it's very much a niche activity what we do is it scalable yes absolutely in terms of the demand there's far more demand for what we do than, than what we can uh, what we can do um it is in fact quite easy to scale of course at a certain point you know we target a 20 million fund size that means 50 to 70 deals in portfolio so ultimately there's a limitation to what you can to how usefully you can scale it within one fund, but of course nothing prevents you from uh, from splitting off into different funds. Uh, so this is eminently scalable. Of course, you want to also scale the network. You want to scale the de-risking side of things. Um, so maybe for me, the last uh, thing I'd like to say is when when anyone looks at what we do, all of us as funds, we're always struggling with the same challenges. And it's the client acquisition cost, the transaction cost, the monitoring cost, and then the, the risk, the credit risk itself. And so I believe Jovitas and I were, were you know, we, we had a great opportunity to share our approach. Uh, we believe that for Campania that our approach is excellently suited for the niche that we occupy. And we invite a lot of other uh, funds to, to join us. There's a lot of a lot of work uh, in this segment. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you for having us, for having me. Thank you, Wouter. Jovitas. Yes, Sunday, it's true. Uh, it's an initial thing. Uh, it's the mandate of the investors, but we are also, uh, like I said, we are, it is a scale up. We are, as I said, we are trying to scale up so that to be sustainable to market. Great. Thank you. And so I just will highlight on a few points. The right product. So there is not the right product, appropriateness. It's not going to be the same product for every market for what you want to target. Like Jovita said as well, if you want to go for returns, then you might target a different segment. But for the segment that they're targeting, you need to have the right product, make sure it's appropriate. You need the right investors. They have to be aligned. If you're going to be Mission first, impact first, you need impact first investors. So you're not going to get, it doesn't, you don't want a commercial first investor because they'll steer you or force you in a different direction. And 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 third, donors, I think, and the message I, I get here, we need to focus, we focus too much on risk. There's only a certain amount you can de-risk to. There's going to always be this cost we overlook to serve, especially rural markets and small transaction sizes. And that's something I think Aseli has been really innovative in trying to address that issue. And finally, I do really think about this question of scale differently, especially with the type of work we're doing. I think that you guys are doing exactly what we should be doing. You're experimenting, you're innovating, and to kind of, we can learn from this. And maybe your own funds won't scale to billions, hundreds of millions or billions, but the lessons we'll learn will be important for others to replicate or, or uh, for other activities to adopt when they expand. Because we know that um, even if you grew 
you wouldn't we wouldn't be able you wouldn't be able to do it by yourselves. So thanks again, and let me pass it back to you, Nadia. Thank you so much, Songbei, and thank you to both of the panelists. Um, that was really interesting discussion. I certainly learned a lot. So the recording will be available on the Safin and Market Links websites. If people want to listen to it again or share it with others who weren't able to attend and might be interested. We also invite you to join us for the next two sessions. So next one will be a conversation with donors and will take place in late March. So with that, thank you for your participation. Thank you again to the speakers, Songbei. Thanks very much. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>